please, to the book of Habakkuk, the third chapter. We're going to end, and if you have just recently joined us, we have been in a series of messages over the last, this is the fourth week, that I've been teaching on this subject, Strong Faith for Confusing Times. Never in my life have I ever seen an hour like you and I have, are living in. Let me say this at the outset. I'm not trying to get political. I don't do that. I've learned over the years of pastoring and preaching, I don't really care what the Republicans say, and I don't really care what the Democrats say. I only care what God says. That's all I care about. And your Bible and my Bible says that a house divided, Jesus said it. A house divided against itself will not stand, and neither will a nation. And in a nation, we're divided right down the middle. We live in confusing times, very confusing times. I really, and I'm not a prophet, I'm not a seer, I can't see into the future, but I can tell you this much. We keep going like we are, and we will eventually turn on each other and destroy each other from the inside. And I have this sneaking suspicion that God has already looked over the banisters of heaven, and the wheels of judgment are already being prepared for nations who thumb their nose at the Holy God. <coughs> Over the past several weeks, I've dealt with several subjects, and this morning I want to deal with one final subject out of this third chapter, and I want to talk to you in the next screen. When you feel like quitting. Now I look at this congregation, dressed up, sharp looking, and I doubt there's one of you in this room who's ever felt that way. Never felt like throwing in the towel. Never felt like waving the white flag and saying, I just give up. Or putting a mistletoe on your coattail and walking out. You'll catch that picture in a minute. <laughs> Many a time I thought about quitting. And a lot of stuff. There's not a one of us that hasn't. Even the prophet. Habakkuk thought that. What do you do when you feel like quitting? What do you do when the pressure is too hard? What do you do when the enemy is still there? What do you do after you have prayed for a length of time and asked God to do seemingly impossible and nothing changes? Do you say that this thing called faith is no good, it really doesn't work? Or do you hold steady long enough for God to show up, even if it takes a long time for it to get there? Over the past four weeks, and I'm going to show you just a thumbnail sketch of what I've talked about. Over the last four weeks, and look at the next slide, if you would please. In chapter one, we've talked about the prophet's faith being tested and him being stretched when I talk to you about the subject when God does not make sense. When you pray, the answers are not what you really thought they would be. Because the people of Judah, to, do, to understand for just a moment, the people of Judah, which is God's people, are rebelling against the Lord in this book. And Habakkuk the prophet is now sent with, from God with a message to these people. And Habakkuk thought that he could just pray a simple prayer and God could just turn things around. But what's interesting by the time you get to the third chapter of the book of Habakkuk, nothing has changed. Everything is still the same. Everything on the outside is the same, except when you get to the third chapter, something different inside of Habakkuk has changed. All the Babylonians, Babylonians are still going to come. Judgment is still going to happen. In chapter 1, his faith is tested. In chapter 2, his faith is taught because he wrestles with God over this issue of judgment. If you take the time or if you've read the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk, you will notice five times in the second chapter, God uses the word woe, five different occasions. Those woes were not for the people of Judah. Those woes were for the people of Babylon. And God was saying, I'm going to bring judgment upon those people 
who come and touch my people. But by the time you get to the third chapter, as I've already said, things are still the same on the outside. In fact, if you go back and study history, it took 70 years, 7-0, seven 70 years for the Babylonians to show up and punish the people of Judah. I'm not sure that Habakkuk was still alive by then. He may have died still believing that God was going to have mercy on the people of Judah. But he believed God. And so all of a sudden, with things looking like they are on the outside, how in the world can I change on the inside? So from being tested to being taught, when you get to this, the third chapter, now there's a triumphant attitude in the life of Habakkuk the prophet. Or let me take it one step further. Look. Look at the screen. Here's what, he's, here's what happened to him. He went from fear to faith. He went from burden to blessing. He went from perplexity to praise. He went from confusion to confidence. He went from worry to worship. My question was, how in the world do you have to, a man of God who had the touch of God upon his life, who had an open heaven before him, who was a prophet of the Lord, who could communicate with God Almighty, how do you have to go from fear to faith? How do you go from burden to blessing? How do you go from perplexity to praising God? How do you go from confusion to confidence? How do you go from worry to worship? Because certainly, sir, if you can do it somehow, some way, I can do it on the inside. Because I face the same kind of enemy that you face. I face the same kind of problems that you face. I need an answer. I need an answer in confusing times. I need a faith that's going to get me through the battle to the very end of this victorious race that we're in. I want to be able to come out victorious when it's all said and done at the end of this race. But how in the world do you do that, Habakkuk? How in the world do you find yourself having looked and prayed things are still the same on the inside? If I had the power to call that minor prophet back from the dead, he would stand before us this morning and he would give you what I'm about to release to you today. How do I go from perplexity to praise in confusing times? How do I go from worry to worshiping God Almighty? There's three ways. I invite you to open to chapter 3. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use my, my telephone this morning because I have the app on it. And I'm going to read to you out of the Living Bible. If I read out of the various Bibles that I have been reading out during this series, I would have brought about a half a dozen Bibles. So I brought the Living Bible this morning because it makes it, makes it a little clearer to me. Now, I need things clear from time to time. I need to be able to understand. It's not on the screen. You're going to need to keep your Bibles open. But I'm going to give you three things of how to go from fear to faith, burden to blessing, perplexity to praise, confusion to confidence, worry to worship. I want to get us to the end of being triumphed this morning before we leave this earth. Here's how, how, did, how did Habakkuk learn to go from the inside out? As I said, things are still the same on the outside. Nothing has changed. Everything is still bad. Everything is still dark. The Babylonians are still coming. How then, sir, can I be strong on the inside of my life? Here's the first thing. Chapter number 3, verse number 1 and 2. He began to pray to God Almighty. Now watch please. Verse, chapter 3, verse number 1. I read to you from the Living Bible. Verses 1 and 2. This is the prayer of triumph that Habakkuk, that Habakkuk sang before the Lord. Verse 2. O Lord, now I have heard your report. And I worship you in all for the fearful things you are going to do. Or the awesome things you are going to do. In this time of our deep need, boy, I, I thought, I am reading a prayer that a man prayed thousands of years ago that is so relevant in the hour you and I are living in this morning. In this time of our deep need, begin again to help us as you did in years gone by. Show us your power to save us. And then he closed out verse number two in this beautiful prayer that he's praying before Almighty God. Knowing that the Babylonians are still coming, knowing that judgment is about to fall, Habakkuk prayed, in your wrath, remember mercy, my God. Amen. Remember mercy. You're a God of compassion. You're a God of tenderness. You're a God of long-suffering. 
You're a God that cares about your people. These are your people, God. And so what did Habakkuk start doing? What began to change? He began to change. He began to zero upon God. He began to look. He looked at the awesome things that were coming. The terrible things that were going to happen. The report from the Babylonians that were going to come against the people of Judah. And Habakkuk didn't stand and wave a white flag. Habakkuk did the very thing that every one of God's people need to do from time to time. And that is to get in our prayer closet, ladies and gentlemen, and call to a God in heaven that still hears and answers prayer. That's what you and I need to learn how to do. That's where we need to go from time to time. I don't, listen to me, I don't, I don't need to know what Fox News or CNN or ABC or NBC or CBS has to say. All I need to do is go before God Almighty, look at the awesomeness of a holy God, and realize and say to God, yes, in the United States of America, we may face hard times. We may face difficult situations. We can't keep this divided line down the middle. 50% that way, 50% the other way. And we're so angry at each other that we're at each other's throat. Ladies and gentlemen, the church needs to go to prayer once and for all. For the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. That the power of God can fall one more time in the United States of America. And God show up and show out like he did in days of old. Habakkuk is saying, Habakkuk is saying, God, we've heard your report. We heard what you used to do. When I was a kid, I used to hear about the miracles of the Lord. I used to hear what I call old timers, and now I am one. Oh my God. <laughs> I used to hear the old timers talk about the day of old when they saw miracles. And I, thought, I, I began to stretch my head recently, and I said to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I don't want to hear stories. I, I thank you because it builds my faith, and I thank you for what's happened in the past. But I don't want to hear stories. I want to be in the midst of a story where the glory of God is poured out, the power of the Holy Spirit is operating, signs, wonders, and miracles are taking place. I want to be around people who have so much faith, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And it takes prayer, ladies and gentlemen, to move the hand of Almighty God. You know what we need in the United States of America to do? We need to ask God for mercy one more time upon this nation. Because if we do not, if we do not mark it down, mark my words this day, on this 30th day of September of 2018, if we keep this up, the holy God of heaven is going to deal with this nation of ours that you and I are part of. Like it or not, like it or not, that's why the church must do exactly like Habakkuk said. We must call out to a holy God through the power of prayer. Here's the second thing that changed him. He had a vision. Now, I don't have time to read you verses 3 to verse 15. You need to go back and you need to read them this afternoon somewhere. But here's what I want you to pay close attention. Beginning in verse 13, I want to take up to verse 13, down to verse 15. And I want you to listen to it from the Living Bible. Here's what it says. Break into verse 13. Habakkuk has this vision now of God's power and his awesomeness upon his own the people of Babylon. You went out to save your chosen people. You crushed the heads of the wicked and laid bare his bones from head to toe. You destroyed with their own weapons those who came out like a whirlwind, thinking Israel would be an easy prey. Your horsemen marched across the sea. The mighty waters piled high. Doesn't that sound familiar? You know where that comes from? Habakkuk has a vision. But he has a vision that goes back thousands of years when God supernaturally brought Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. And Habakkuk said, wait a minute. You're the God. I am praying to you. You're Jehovah God. You're the God that shook Egypt. You're the God that devastated that nation. You're the God that supernaturally brought Israel out of bondage. You're the God that sent the Red Sea parting with us by a strong wind. You're the God that led your people through on dry ground. And you're the God. You're the God. Oh, listen to me. You're the God that caused Pharaoh and his army to go in after Israel. And then you closed up the waters and you destroyed the entire army. 
army of the Egyptians by your divine power. I'm praying not to some wooden idol. I'm not praying to a stone idol. I'm not praying to a God that cannot hear Habakkuk is saying, I see you who've done it in the past, so I'm asking you one more time, show up and show out in behalf of your people. Here's what I learned in verses 13 to verse 15. Look at the screen with me, please. Here's what I learned. First of all, the utter defeat of those who oppose God. Listen, God will deal with those who oppose Him. You cannot, listen to me carefully, nobody in this nation or any other nation on this globe can continue to thumb their nose at a holy God and think they'll get by with it. The utter defeat of those who oppose, Pharaoh opposed God. Believe it or not, Pharaoh had a chance to repent. Believe it or not, Pharaoh had an opportunity. Nine times, nine times, God showed up to Pharaoh. And every time God showed up and Pharaoh sent Moses out, God, began, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Until you get to a point in Scripture where it says now, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Now on the tenth time, you cannot keep opposing God. You cannot keep thumbing your nose at a holy God. When you feel like quitting, when the devil has lied to you over and over and over, and you feel like waving a white flag, and you have unbelievable pressure come your direction, hang on, beloved, because God is not against you. God is for you. And if God be for us, who in the world can be against us? Hallelujah. So there is the other defeat of those who oppose God. Look at the next thing. I learned there's a divine determination to do whatever it takes to deliver God's people. Ask Daniel if God will not show up in the nick of time. Ask the Hebrew boys if God will not show up in the nick of time. Ask David as he's on the battlefield facing a nine foot nine guy. And the guy, the Goliath says, I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air. And David said, sir, you're not in covenant relationship with Jehovah God. I'm in covenant relationship with Jehovah God. You come to me, sir, with a sword and a spear. But I come to you in the name of the covenant God of Jehovah. And my God will deliver me in the nick of time if necessary. And bring me through the victory. Hang on, church. The pressure may get hard. The pressure may get tough. We may be squeezed from all sides. And the, the United States of America government may say we can no longer read this Bible. Please understand this pastor this morning. God will deliver his people no matter how tough the situation gets. Right? Is still, things are still the same on the outside. But he prayed and he saw God. Look at the third thing. Verse 16. Verse 16. It's important to have a testimony. I said it's important to have a testimony. David said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sometimes we need some say so meetings. I really believe. And I've probably been a little negligent in not having testimonies from time. I love to hear what God's doing in your life. Let the redeemed of the Lord. And here's a redeemed prophet who is prophesying. And he has this confession. You've heard me time and time again over the past year talk to you about being careful what comes out of your mouth. Because if you talk negative, you're going to get negative. But if you talk the word, it will change circumstances and the atmosphere and situations in your life. Have a good kind of testimony. Look at the first thing that we have. Look at the next slide. Verse 16. Here's the first thing that he says. He accepts the situation. Let me read it to you now. Out of this translation. Verse 16. I tremble when I hear all this. My lips quiver with fear. My legs give way beneath me. And I shake in terror. What's he talking about? He is, he is shaking about what God is about to do to Babylon. He realizes they have messed with God and they have messed with God's people. And Habakkuk said, now 
I see this vision and I'm testifying that I accept what's about to happen. And look what he says now. He declares, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come, up, to come upon the people who invade us. I will wait for the people that are, that are opposing us for the day of trouble to visit them. Now follow me carefully, please. Watch. He made up his mind and he settled the fact that the God that he served was such a compassionate God, even though he was going to deal in judgment, he was still going to save his people, Judah. Listen to me carefully. He was, everything was still the same on the outside, but on the inside, he said, I trust you no matter what. Doesn't matter what is about to happen. Doesn't matter what's going to take place. My confidence is not in what my eyes see. My confidence is what my eyes do not see. Because what my eyes see is temporal, but what I don't see is eternal. And what I'm seeing eternal will far outshine that which is here temporal. And Habakkuk said, I rest in the fact that judgment is coming, but I trust you to have mercy upon your people. As I've already said, I don't even know if he was still alive when it happened, because it was a 70 long year period before the judgment of God through the Babylonians would come upon the people of Judah. But he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. I already talked to you about waiting in chapter 2. He, God said to him, though it tarry, wait for it. And he waited some 70 years, not even knowing if he would live or die, but he believed that God would be merciful. He accepted it. But look at the second thing that he said. He made a commitment. I'm about to close this message. The third chapter of Habakkuk is actually a song. It's a hymn. I don't know if Habakkuk was a guitar player or a bass player, but he had some kind of instrument, and he played this third chapter in the presence of God. This was a song that he sang to Jehovah God. He looked at the bad scene. He looked at the judgment that was coming. He looked at the confusing times that he was in. And his faith was now so strong, not on what was on the outside, but what had happened to him on the inside. I want to read to you from the new from the, from, from my Bible, Habakkuk chapter three. Look at verses seventeen and eighteen. I want you to pay close attention to what Habakkuk said. Notice carefully: though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail. And the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. Stop for a moment. This is not a this is not a list that he's just randomly writing down, because you have to understand ancient Israel. This was an agricultural world that that Habakkuk is writing about. This is somebody's portfolio that he's talking about. This is a portfolio that he's writing, that he's listing everything. This is somebody's 401k. This is somebody's retirement. And he has said, listen to him, judgment is coming. I don't know what God is going to do. But though there may not be fig trees blossoming, and there may not be fruit on the vines, and there may not be labor of the olive, and there may be no fields that give no food, though there be no flocks in the, in the fold, and there's no herds in the stall. What does Habakkuk say? Does he say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit. I'm going to wave a white flag. I'm going to say I've had enough. I can't stand this God of judgment. I don't want to see judgment, so I'm going to put a mistletoe on my coattail, and I'm going to walk out. And I'm going to say to heck with it all, because I don't want to serve a God that's that kind of God. No, Habakkuk didn't do that. Listen to what the prophet said. I love verse 18. Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Why? Because the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk upon my high heels. My God, my God, my God. What are you going to do? Now watch me. Listen to me closely. Look at the scripture. I took this from the lesson Bible. Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, 
I love this. Though the Arab ones are wormy and the wheat fields stunned, go on. Though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, watch it. I'm singing joyful praise to God. Yeah. Look at the next verse. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God. Counting on God's rule to prevail. Watch it. I take heart and I gain strength. I run like a deer. I love what he said. I feel like I'm king of Mount Listen to this pastor. Look at the screen. What happens? Because sometimes the fig tree does not bud. And sometimes, beloved, there are no grapes on the vine. And sometimes the olive crop fails. And sometimes the fields produce no food. Go on. Sometimes there are no sheep in the pen. And sometimes there's no cattle in the stall. What do you do? When cystic fibrosis takes your child. You put a mistletoe on your coattail and walk out on God and say, I can't serve you because you're that kind of God. What do you do? If the Lord doesn't heal a brain tumor, do you say, how in the world could you be so unfair? Do you wave a white flag and turn tail and walk out on God? No. No. You look death square in the eye. And you look hell and the devil square in the eye. And you say, just like Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice. No matter what, I will rejoice. I'll continue to give praise, though there be no 401k for me. Though there be no retirement plan set up for me. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice and joy in Him. Why? Because He is a fair God and a good God and a loving God and a just God. And He is far not against me. And if I know he's for me, listen to me. He, uh, Habakkuk said, he's made my feet like deer's feet so that while the world is shaking, the church is standing still, my God. While the world is trembling, the church is standing still. And we walk with our head held high and our shoulders back. And we're giving praise to God Almighty. Because God When you feel like quitting, let me show you one, two more things. I'm finished. You can't have a chapter three faith without the wondering of chapter one and the waiting of chapter two. You'll never get to chapter three. You'll never have faith if there's not moments in your own Christian life that you question God. You say, can I trust you? Can I trust you with this? Can I do what the songwriter says? Trust and obey. For there's no other way. Let me close. Look at this. Faith chooses to believe. Let me close. I've said that three times. I'm really close. <laughs> Her name is Kay Warren. She's the wife of Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California. Rick and Kay were put in the spotlight a couple of years ago when their 27-year-old son Matthew committed suicide. It was devastating. I want to read you this in closing. I want you to think about what I've just said. Though there be no cattle in the stalls, though there are no crops to be had, though there's no jobs to be held, what are you going to do? We're still going to trust God. On July the 18th, 1985, 
This is her. I gave birth to our beloved gift of God, Matthew David Warren. Holding him in my arms that morning, I had no idea how dark the journey would get for him and for those who love him. All I knew was that that bright morning was that I was madly in love with him and could see nothing ahead but a mother's dream of good life for her son. I remember Easter 1985. I was sick in bed, unable to go to church. Rick took the kids to church and I stayed by myself for a few hours. The TV remote by my side was my only companion. And somehow, I dropped the remote and couldn't retrieve it, so there I was alone on one of the most joyous holidays with not even a TV preacher to keep me company. <laughs> Full of anxiety and fear for myself and my unborn child, and I painfully reached for my Bible and it fell open to Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. She writes this from the NIV Bible. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Because the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to go on the heights. This was a word of the Lord to me. And I determined that even if my worst nightmares came true, if my baby died and I never walked again, that I would trust in God my Savior, I would rejoice in the sovereign Lord. Matthew David Warren was born and everything seemed fine, but by his first birthday we began to wonder. And by his second and third birthdays we knew he wasn't like his older sister and brother. When he took his life last year, after battling and fighting so hard for decades, a friend sent me Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 in a sympathy card. She had no idea this passage was incredibly significant to me, but it was the fitting book in to his life. Because I had feared for years that he would take his life, it became his greatest pursuit and my deepest anguish. I had to come to the point in which I said, as I had 27 years before, even if my worst nightmares come true and he takes his life, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. So today, his 29th birthday, through weeping, I shouted to the watching universe, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. My heart remains wounded and battered, but my faith is steady. There is and will be, as Stephen Curtis Chapman says, a glorious unfolding of all that God has in store for me and my family. God is faithful to his promises of rebuilding and restoring the ruins, and I'm confident that I will yet be a witness to many, many, many lives healed and hope restored, all because of my beloved gift of God, Matthew David Warren. And then she closed. I miss you, darling boy, but it will be just for a little while. What do you do? What do you do when there's no hope? What do you do? I've already said, you put your shoulders back, you put your head up, and you lift your hands and hang heavy. And you say like heaven to the Lord. I, and you say it loud enough to shake heaven and scare hell. I will rejoice in God, my Savior. If you can say that, you're walking the walk of faith. But without faith, it is impossible. <laughs> wow. I thank you, Father. Wow. I thank you for this prophet, this minor prophet, written thousands of years ago, spoken thousands of years ago. 
but yet so relevant to the moment that we are part of today. We live in a confusing world, Holy Spirit. We live in a world when people are pitted against one another. We live in a world where people are screaming and yelling at one another. We live in a world that is absolutely about to go off its, it, the, the edge of the cliff and the wheels are coming off unless you step in and have mercy upon every one of us. Revive thy work. Holy Spirit, revive thy work. Not just in the land. Revive your work inside this preacher this morning. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I don't want to wave a white flag. I don't want to call it quits on God Almighty. Though things may go on and though things may happen. I want to be like Habakkuk. And no matter if there's cattle or not. No matter if there's, there's sheep or not. No matter if there's a portfolio or not. I still can hold my head up high. And I still can hold my shoulders back. And with every ounce of breath inside of me declare. I will rejoice in the God of Israel, the God of my salvation. Amen. I will. It's a matter of choice. I choose to live by. It's a choice that I have. It's a choice. God, you told Israel in Deuteronomy, choose. You have a choice between death and life. God, you said to Israel, choose life. Choose life. You have a choice. And the same choice is given to us today as a congregation. We have a choice of death or we have a choice of life. And you're saying to us as a nation, choose life. Therefore, Holy Spirit, I cry out only as one individual. Let this nation choose life this morning. Let this church choose faith this morning. Let us rise to the occasion. We may walk, we may have walked in this room with all kinds of hell breathing down our neck. But this morning, you're not against us. You're for us. And if you're for us, what in the world can be against us? You put angels around us. You put warning angels around us. You put grace upon us. You put victory upon us. And you put victory in us. No matter what our eyes look at, we need to take our eyes off what we see and turn our eyes of faith on what we cannot see on a God that has everything under control. My God. So this morning, in the name of Jesus, let us make the right choice to choose to have feet like a deer that is so steady while everything else is coming unraveled around us. That we have the peace of God that passes all understanding.